Greetings to all of you. My name is Konstantinos Donas. I am professor of vascular surgery, head of the department of vascular surgery at the Asclepius Clinic Langen University Hospital of Frankfurt in Germany. I'm more than glad to welcome you here today in the platform of Radcliffe Vascular, uh, having as topic the big topic of uh, hostile neck, of the big challenge, how can we treat hostile necks? How can we overcome uh, this uh, obstacle in our clinical practice when we are dealing with uh, triple A's? I'm more than glad to have you here today because this webinar has some uh, unique uh, parameters. First of all, it is a non-industry founded webinar. This is very important because uh, we are not going to be biased to present the one or the other technique. But as the title of the webinar is, we want to search and suggest you for your clinical practice, an algorithm to treat patients with hostile necks and AAAs. The second is that uh, this webinar has no introduction with literature, with uh, patency rates, with endolix rates, but we prepared talks having as uh, focus cases. So we want to see cases we're gonna present you anatomical parameters and we will have the opportunity with two experts to discuss and see their treatment options. And please feel free to send questions, be active. This is the opportunity to hear your comments, to hear your considerations and your approaches. The third reason why this webinar is, uh, I'm thinking an excellent webinar is because we have two experts who have experience with all available options. Professor Jean-Paul de Vries, who is the head of the University Hospital of Groningen in the Netherlands, well-known name, an expert in the field of AAAs with complex iliacs, with complex necks, is today with us. Hello, Jean-Paul. Yes, good afternoon, Costas. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Jean-Paul. And also Professor Drosos Kotelis, Deputy Chef of the University Hospital Aachen of the Department of Vascular Surgery, an expert in the treatment of complex AAAs. Hello, Drosos. Hello, Kostas. I'm very happy to have you here today because as I highlighted, we will have the opportunity to see from your clinical practice cases and we will have the opportunity to discuss your approaches, including open approach, EVAR, ESAR, CHIVAR, but also fenestrated endografting. During the webinar, you will have the opportunity to give your feedback by answering different polls. You will hear this from the speakers. You will have the opportunity with q &A options to send me questions, and I will be more than glad to present your points and your considerations to the panelists. Dear Jean-Paul, I would like now to give you the micro to start this webinar. And again, thank you for accepting the invitation. Yeah, again, thank you also, Costas, for this, uh, I think, interesting uh, hour to discuss all the uh, other possibilities and the treatment options for uh, a hostile neck anatomy in patients with, uh, with triple A's. So my, yeah, my uh, title is really focused, of course, on off-the-shelf solutions. I think that is important to emphasize. Uh, my main topic is the off-the-shelf uh, solutions. Well, I do have some disclosures, uh, which are pointed out here. I think we will first start with the, with the first poll uh, question. Uh, how would the audience currently treat a patient with a hostile neck regarding off-the-shelf endovascular techniques? It can be standard EVAR, it can be ESAR, so with the use of the end of anchors or chimney EVAR, so in patients with hostile necks. So may I ask you, um, Costas, what is your opinion? What is your yeah. favorite treatment? Well, um, probably you will hear, you expecting to say CHIVAR only, <laughs> but um, we have to consider the different philosophy of the treatments. So with the EVAR and ESAR, we are achieving uh, an improvement in the fixation of the device. With the CHIVAR, we are creating a new neck. So I think this is very important uh, in the case of the hostile neck to decide preoperatively 
which will be, let's say, the main characteristic you would, you would like to improve the fixation in order to have durable results? Or do you believe that there is no option for uh, this neck uh, if I'm going to stay infrarenally? So I need a new neck. I need a new seal zone in a healthy segment. And this would be probably my decision point. Yeah, I think that it's also really important to differentiate between, well, adding strength or adding seal. And that is the real difference, I think, also between ESR and, uh, and chimney uh, techniques. Shall we uh, see how the audience has voted? Or, or for example, Drossos can say, uh, uh, Drossos, which is your opinion about this? How you would treat a patient with hostile neck if you have to select only of the shelf uh, endovascular techniques? Yes, I, I also agree with you, Kostas, um, about your remarks. And uh, I think in some symptomatic cases and in elderly patients that are comorbid, uh, sometimes I would, I would choose uh, for CVAR, as I would also say, show in my presentation later. But of course, sometimes also in younger patients, we need also um, the open solution. Um, but this is not the question in, in, this, in this first question. We're talking about endovascular uh, solutions now. Okay. So most of the times I would, I would say in, in some symptomatic patients, TIVA. Okay. Let's see the, the, the answers, dear Jean-Paul. Yeah, I think the, well, chimney wins. Um, and that's maybe, yeah, that's, I think, good. But it's really to extend uh, the seal. And I think we're all happy maybe to see that uh, so many uh, people of the audience embrace also the chimney technique. Yeah. So uh, I have a short introduction about the difference between the, the preoperative neck length. Uh, we all know that uh, per definition, the, the neck ends uh, in core lab. Uh, adjustment when the diameter increases more than 10% of, uh, of baseline and there's a difference uh, of, the, of the seal zone and the seal zone really is at a post uh, EVAR CT scan where there is circumferential seal uh, between the endograft and the uh, aortic uh, wall. And that is, of course, uh, well, it's important that we all know there are adequate necks, vanilla anatomy, where the neck length is long, it's a straight neck, and then the seal zone is, uh, is similar or the same length. We do have hostile uh, necks where the preoperative neck length may be short, but if you have enough oversizing of a standard endograft, the seal zone, the postoperative seal zone will be longer and may be sufficient. And we do have the inadequate neck, so we have a very short, per definition, infrarenal neck, but also, well, it's too uh, wide, uh, the neck, you can never have a position, uh, and that is what we define as an inadequate uh, neck. Is it important? Yes, of course, the, the, well, the adequate necks can uh, be uh, treated with standard EVAR. We only need seal. Maybe in the hostile necks, in the hostile zone, you want to add strength to seal. And in an inadequate neck, it's, it's, well, it's obvious you need to extend uh, the length and the seal in the yuxta or suprarenal uh, aorta. So then I think an adequate neck can be standard EVAR. In hostile necks, maybe there is an advantage of uh, endo anchors. For inadequate necks, it's obvious of the shelf solutions are chimney EVAR or a, a physician modified a fenestrated endograft. Well, I think we all know that, that of course, if there are more uh, risk factors in hostile seal zones, it really increases not only failure rates, but also mortality. Uh, in the uh, short term, but also in the long term in patients. I think what Rosses also emphasizes is that some patients, of course, are young, they have long life expectancy, and you really want to have a primary endograft or endo uh, uh, procedure, uh, which is good. So you really want to have a good circumferential seal of at least one centimeter. Well, this is then uh, an example, it's not my case, but an example of a hostile neck. So there's a very short, maybe a preoperative neck length, four millimeter. However, if you oversize the endograft enough, you can extend the seal because the neck diameter is 24. And if you use it, for instance, a 28 device, uh, you, re you really can extend the post-operative uh, seal zone. Well, and there is where the endo anchors can be of advantage to add strength to the uh, seal and then the preoperative neck length 
calculated is only four millimeters, but with that oversizing, you can extend the seal zone to at least uh, one centimeter, I think, which is really the minimum uh, we want to have for a sustainable outcome. Well, a few slides only about the results of the uh, of the NMX of the of the uh, anchor uh, registry, uh, four years data, low type one endoleaks, and a high freedom from aneurysm related mortality, and also from aneurysm uh, rupture. Uh, but still, there is a need for secondary uh, endovascular procedures in at around 14% of uh, those patients. Well, is it important to have a good fixation? Yes, uh, I think we all are aware that sex regression is important. This is a study, a propensity matched a cohort study, almost 100 patients in each group, and one, pa one patient group with standard uh, endo anchors versus uh, only patients with EVAR, and then the patients with additional endo anchors had a significantly higher sex regression. And that is important because sex regression really also is uh, of influence uh, on outcome. So the higher the sex regression, the better is the mid and long term uh, outcome. Well, this is then uh, obvious a patient with an inadequate uh, uh, neck. Uh, it's at a preoperative calculation, it's only three millimeters, it's too wide, you can never have circumferential apposition. So even then, the seal would be only five millimeters, which is really too short, and those are the patients which needed uh, extension. And again, it can be with chimney, uh, endograft, or um, physician-modified FIVAR uh, if you want to have an off-the-shelf solution. And I think we all aim for at least one centimeter, but uh, by, I think, uh, it's, it's obvious to have more seal zone than only one centimeter. Well, off-the-shelf solutions, uh, symptomatic patients, it can also uh, save time and, and costs uh, compared to, um, well, the customized uh, fenestrated endografts. It takes, of course, more waiting time, I think at least uh, uh, six to eight weeks, but also the total cost will increase. Well, then uh, this is my uh, case. It's a male patient, 76 year old with uh, cardiopulmonary uh, comorbidity, also a hostile abdomen. He was referred from another hospital to the UMCG and uh, at a duplex, the uh, AAA was uh, 6.2 centimeters. This is my own drawing uh, of the, of the preoperative uh, sizing. So you can see that the, uh, well, the lowest renal artery is at the left. It's a diameter of six millimeters, the highest renal artery, the right, only four millimeters. Then there is a one centimeter neck length, it goes from 30 to 29, so it's rather straight. There's only one, I think, really hostile parameter, and that is the infrarenal angulation, which is at around 85 uh, degrees, and the diameter of the uh, aorta is uh, 6.4 centimeters. So at our preoperative calculation, we thought we could have seal uh, at around one centimeter uh, from the low most left renal artery to the, uh, to the end of the neck. Of course, there are yeah, multiple options. EVAR, maybe ESAR, uh, because, the, because of the angulation. Uh, chimney, uh, well, we, uh, we thought about that. Uh, but then only for the left renal artery, although there was a, um, a stenosis of the, of the subclavian arteries at both sides fenestrated, although the inferior neck angulation was severe and for open reconstruction, we thought it was not a good idea because of the uh, comorbidity of the patient and the hostile uh, abdomen. So what we did is to, uh, well, to um, treat patients with a standard EVAR device. It was an endurance uh, 36 millimeters to oversize the 30 millimeter uh, neck. And uh, of course, aiming at the left uh, renal artery. And then here you can see that we, uh, yeah, we also implanted endo anchors. And this is not a video, this is only uh, one uh, picture, uh, but you can see at the uh, outer curve, uh, why we needed the endo anchors, and that was because there was a uh, well, rather huge uh, type 1a endo leak. Although I think at the left side we had a good apposition just below the renal artery, 
uh, but the endograft is also tilted. It's it's not uh, it's it's a little bit tilted. So I think we 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 lose some apposition at the outer curve, um, and yeah, we had to treat that type one a end leak with uh, with endo anchors. This is uh, one of the um, uh, um, implantations of the endo anchors, and because the endo leak was at the outer curve. Uh, we focused especially at the outer curve with the uh, endo anchors. Well, then the final result was uh, was okay, uh, not any endo leak. I think a good seal, uh, but again, we thought it would be standard EVAR, but we needed the use of the endo anchors. Well, this is the post-operative CT scan at uh, one month. Uh, you can clearly see the the endo anchors at the outer curve. And here is to uh, well to prove that there is not an endo leak also at the one month CT scan. So for me, it's I think it's well rather clear the the algorithm uh, of treatment of, of hostile necks. If it's if there is not any hostile neck characteristic, of course you can use EVAR as long as we have a position of more than one centimeter uh, circumferentially in the hostile neck zones. I think if we are, if you have a good apposition and I think the final NGO is without any endo leaks, um, leave it. Uh, if there is an endo leak or you think or that the uh, circumferential apposition is less than one centimeter, uh, I liberally go for uh, additional endo anchors. Uh, and otherwise, I think it's clear in an off-the-shelf um, fashion, we need the chimney endograft. I don't use or physician modified um, fenestrated grafts, so then we really prefer uh, the chimney uh, technique. Yeah, so maybe the audience of you have changed um, the well thinking about how to treat um, patients with a hostile neck, uh, and again. We still focus on off-the-shelf endovascular techniques. So, would you still treat patients with EVAR or additional endo anchors, so ESAR or a chimney uh, endografting? Joseph, do you want to comment some? Yeah, uh, yeah excellent. Let's uh, comment a little bit. Um, first of all, I had in my mind, and I have it also in my clinical practice in my mind, your study, which showed that independent on your skills based on your profound, sophisticated analysis CT scan, we have to keep in mind we are losing three millimeter in average uh, of the apposition of the device. I think this is a very, very important uh, parameter because even if we are doing the analysis, you are not going to deploy the device, not because you are not an expert, but this is the clinical reality and the real life. So I think this is very crucial. This is the first message which I have to say to our uh, uh, friends and colleagues who are watching our uh, webinar. The second is this case which you showed is an excellent case which I think can be done by all the three options. So you can do EVAR with, I would say, a really good oversized device. You know how much I love the oversizing of Endurant. I think this is very, very important to keep in mind that uh, with endurance device, you don't have to have any considerations with oversizing. I have also the similar experience that in angulated necks, ESAR is very effective for the outer curvature. And also you could do CHIVAR because you had a distance between the upper and the lower renal artery. Uh, so you would go for single chimney for the left. And then you would create a seal zone of at least 25 millimeters. So it depends now on your, let's say, preferences. But there is no doubt also that the renal artery, uh, I saw, if I saw right, it was six millimeter in diameter without severe stenosis. So actually nice to access from above. And I think this is uh, the best example which someone can, uh, let's say, draw in order to see that Everything is possible based on your talk. Uh, very nice example. Therefore, I'm really curious to see how now uh, the colleagues will answer. Uh, how would you vote now uh, showing the presentation and the case? Let's see the answers. Yeah. 
<laughs> so indeed, um, you see that the EVAR option is, is a good, let's say, preference for the colleagues. Uh, I see that the EVAR, uh, let's say, not direct as first choice. I think they are waiting to see if they're going to have an endolic and the cheaper option in order to extend uh, the seal zone. Yeah. The question is here, uh, Jean-Paul, do we have evidence that primarily use of endo-anchoring is better than EVAR? Because you know the issues of reimbursement, etc. Yeah, I think the, the maybe the most important study is which I showed about the propensity matched uh, cohort, so standard EVAR and uh, the matched cohort with additional end of anchoring, and that the sec regression was uh, significantly uh, better or higher in the patients with uh, primary uh, end of anchors. And so far, I think we don't have enough data to prove that it really prevents neck dilatation. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's it's mainly about sex regression. And 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 what I, I agree with you, I think the the maybe the the, the main focus of the endomics now still is a type one end treatment of type one end. Yeah. Drossos, what is your opinion about the case? How would you treat uh, the case? Yes, I found it. I found very uh, an excellent case to show, and uh, I would like to ask John Paul if he was thinking about choosing another device other than the Endurant Medronic device. To, you had a, an angulation of sixty degrees, I think. So, did you do? You, do you think that some other device, for example, an Anaconda device, would perform better in this angulation without the need of of uh, endo anchoring? Yeah, it's good. I think every maybe uh, device which is more conformable or which really conforms and is really not tilted uh, in that angulated neck uh, would be better. On the other hand, of course, where we know the, the, the severe angulated uh, series and studies also of the endurance, which is also uh, a good, but maybe in retrospect, uh, a more conformable like an anaconda uh, maybe would have had better seal at the, uh, at, at the outer curve. I think mm -hmm. the good thing about off-the-shelf techniques is, uh, well, of course, we do have endo anchors, but of course, it, it increases the cost. And, well, it's not a selling point, but even if there's an endo leak, you can always do a cuff and uh, a chimney for the left renal. Of course, that is primary, of course, treatment then is would be better, but you don't lose any options uh, if the endo anchors also do, uh, don't work. But... Uh, of course, your primary intervention should be uh, should be the best. Yeah. What about the option to use a gore device, uh, the new comfortable with yeah. the possibility to reattach? Uh, and also here is the big benefit without suprarenal stent. So it is, let's say, easier to perform chivar with cuff uh, compared to the suprarenal stents uh, if you have it in the front of the renals. Yeah, in our last cases with severe angulated necks, uh, that is our preferred uh, endograft. Yeah, especially in that angulations. And also the angulation is just below the, the, the renal. I think that is also if the neck length is maybe two centimeters and then you do have that angulation, but it was very short uh, below the renal artery. Yeah. Do you have any comments to say about the, you highlighted the importance of seal zone? So mainly when we are having an aneurysm, we are checking the neck length and then we say, okay, this is my preference. What about the seal zone? Is, it, is the same with the neck length or how you evaluating the neck when you have the case in order to decide the, also the degree of oversizing? Yeah, I think that is important. So in that hostile neck uh, or part of the neck, you really want to know that the oversizing is good enough or sufficient enough to really have circumferential apposition. And I think in case of doubt, uh, and you and, and you yeah you you think or you calculate it will be less than one centimeter, uh, we really extend well with chimney or in an on the shelf uh, um, manner with uh, fenestrated uh, endographs. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the only of of course difficulty is that at the uh, the Post-operative CT scan, you really can calculate which uh, amount of apposition uh, you have between the endograft and the uh, article. So pre-operative, it's well, it's always calculating. It's not guessing, 
uh, but if you really think it's less than one century, and I think that's your remark is, is very important. It was our own series, but we had an average of three millimeters below or distance between the fabric and the lower the artery. So if I calculate one centimeter, I think during the implantation, it might be eight or only seven millimeters. Um, so it is always less than uh, the preoperative neck length you measure. Yeah. We have one question from Greece, uh, Dr. Karaolanis. Uh, we know him well, uh, also Kotelis. We published recently a very nice uh, review focusing on fenestrated endografting and realizing that in the literature, we have a gap in the follow-up evaluation based with CT of the visceral vessels outcome, which is very important, considering that we are involving per se the SMA, either as scallop or fenestration. So Dr. Karolans is asking you, dear colleagues, uh, can you give us uh, some of the main indication for ESA? Do you think, for example, presence of calcification of thrombus formation of the neck, which is very often is a contraindication of ESAR. Would you recommend despite this to do it? When do you believe that the, which case is a good case to perform ESAR? Yeah, if I take that one, I think chronicity and angulation is uh, are good indication, especially uh, the combination of uh, uh, chronicity and angulation. Well, thrombus and calcium, if it's more than two uh, millimeters thickness, where well, we know that the endo anchor will never penetrate the aortic wall. Uh, so if you really have 50% circumference uh, with uh, thrombus loads more than two millimeters, well, the endo anchors will never penetrate. Um, so uh, that yeah that that will be a, co a contraindication. Speaker of calcium, of course, you can avoid, but then the preoperative CT scan in your planning is important that you know your C arm uh, angulations or angles to mm -hmm. avoid those uh, those speaker. But but um, yeah, for me uh, in a primary setting, it's especially chronicity and angulation. Okay, for Dr. Kotel is one question from Dr. Walker. Um, you highlighted also the open approach. And the big question is, if you have a short but present infrarenal neck in a young, in a young uh, and relative fit patient, is indeed open treatment the best option or would you go for fever, chivar, ivar with suprarenal, infrarenal fixation? So how would you treat a young and relative fit patient? Because we know also that open approach means for a young patient potentially can have an issue with the, his sexual uh, function. Um, we have now new devices which have better long-term outcomes compared to the old, of course, the generations. Uh, and you know very well that uh, a lot of people um, having data from the internet, so they are coming in the clinics with somehow opinion about treatment options. So how would you treat a young and life fit patient with a 10 millimeter plus minus neck. Yes, uh, I would. Uh, if the patient is really young, he's younger than 60 years of age, or mm -hmm. some very fit uh, uh, patients that are also younger than 65 or something. I would, I would really uh, choose the open approach. And with a short neck, you can have a short uh, suprarenal clamping, give some cold perfusion for the renals and to the proximal anastomosis and uh, then, then clamp distally and, uh, and do the, the, the reconstruction. And sometimes you need a bifurcated um, device. And, and in this case, of course, you have a, a higher risk for, for some issues with, um, with the nerves. Uh, and, and sometimes you have a tubular graft. And, and then in these cases, the risk is is really low. So if a young patient is coming and he's willing to, to get, he, of course you have to inform him of both uh, options. And if, but if he's willing to have an open repair, I would I would go on and uh, offer him an open repair. Jean Paul, a short comment before we go to the talk and presentation from Dr. Kotelis. Yeah, the only thing, if I have a young patient and I treat those with endovancus, and nowadays I do two rows of endovancus because I think that is then a kind of mimicking uh, the anastomosis. Yeah, it's an interesting point. So both uh, we would do the anastomosis endovascularly or open, but it is important to have durable outcomes, as you said. And I think 
as you said, the durability is the most important thing for the young patient. Professor Kotelis, we are more than glad to hear you now presenting your talk and highlighting the fenestrated endografting option, the open repair. I like to see your cases and hear your ex about your experience. Thank you very much, Kostas. These are, oh, first we can start with a, with a poll question. The next poll, poll question, the question is how would you treat a patient suffering a triple A that doesn't qualify for EVAR? So we have four options. The first is FIVAR, the second is open surgical repair, the third is ESAR, and the fourth is CIVA. I think it's important here to highlight, dear colleagues, it is important to hear your treatment options, not the literature opinion, but your treatment options in your hospital is important because you know very well at different meetings when we have these discussions about the therapeutic options, very often we are, we are hearing, for example, the one or the other options. But if you ask directly the colleagues and the participants of the meetings, which kind of options do you offer? then you are you, you're seeing that they are not offering all the options which will be presented at meetings. And I think it's important to hear the clinical reality and see which patients can be treated in the one or the other hospital, which patients can, should be treated in high volume hospitals with all available options. Do you believe, for example, that AAA repair, especially in complex uh, lesions, should be treated in high volume only hospitals or the team plays the major role and not the name of the hospital? This is, what is your opinion, Jean-Paul? Yeah, I think this is a very also actual discussion also in the Netherlands uh, and not only for complex endovascular case, but also for open, uh, yeah. open surgery. Maybe there is more, more of a problem nowadays. Um, well, for us, it's it's obvious. Uh, I think also not 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 every vascular surgeon or not every interventional radiologist maybe uh, will be uh, on board in those complex endovascular teams uh, in the in the near future. So I think you, yeah, it's not about the name of the hospital, but I think it's really the experience of the team. Uh, yeah, we all know the phrase, but you have to know the complications, and I think you have to have those complications to really be good in complex and vascular procedures, uh, because I think that is, the, that is the, maybe the most important thing. If you are in trouble, and we are all sometimes, someday in trouble, you, you have to know how to solve it, uh, because that will spare uh, renals, uh, uh, bowels, uh, et cetera. So for me, the, the team, of course, is more important than the hospital, but it's, I think it's still um, a difficult discussion uh, to see where the cutoff is in volume or uh, experience. Um, okay. yeah. Very good. Uh, do you like to show us, Drossos, your uh, the answer of this uh, poll, um, which is your the answer now? Let's see. So most of the people uh, chose answer B. This is the open surgical repair. Excellent. So we see indeed that the open approach regarding durability, regarding uh, is uh, here to stay. And I think this is very important. Okay, dear Drossos, let's uh, hear your uh, talk and see your cases. So the first case is a 68 year old male patient with a 5.7 centimeter triple A. He had a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, arterial hypertension and diabetes. You can see here the axial CT in this case. This is the celiac trunk, mesenteric artery, the renals. And now you can see the infrarenal neck. You see some thrombus in this infrarenal neck. Mm -hmm. And the iliacs also involved in this case and the iliac bifurcation. If you review this on the coronary view, you can see again here the renals and the infrarenal neck, which is quite conical and uh, thrombogenic. And you can also see in the sagittal view here, the infrarenal portion of the aorta and also some compression of the celiac trunk uh, due to the diaphragm. So in this case, this is the anatomy sketch. We chose in this patient a fourfold uh, fenestrated device. We chose an anaconda device in this case. With anaconda, you can uh, 
position your prosthesis and cannulate your vessels consecutively. So most of the times we start with the renals, in this case, the right renal artery. Here you can see uh, the first attempt to cannulate the celiac trunk going from the contralateral side. You see here, again, the compression of the celiac trunk due to the diaphragm. And in this case, we could not uh, deploy our stent through the contralateral side. So that's why we left this celiac trunk open. We first cannulated and stented the mesenteric artery and the next uh, renal artery. And after finishing these three stents and deploying also the legs on both sides of the, of the prosthesis, we went from the ipsilateral side again, from the right side, and tried to cannulate again the celiac trunk. And through the ipsilateral cannulation, we had more support through the opposition of our, of our sheath to the aortic wall and could push the stent and, uh, to the celiac trunk and stent it. You see the completion angiography in this case. We don't see an endoly. And the, and the post-operative CT shows the patency of the stents in the celiac trunk, mesenteric artery, and renals. We also don't see any endoleaks here, any type 2 endoleaks. And also the coronary view, you see that the stents are nice. And most importantly, in the sagittal view, you see how this uh, stand, in this case, this is a Bentley stand, how it performs in this compressed celiac trunk. So it's open and uh, you have a, a good patency also with the compression of the celiac trunk in this case. Uh, excellent, outstanding uh, demonstration of your skills uh, in uh, this very nice case. Uh, the first question which I have in my mind is regarding the bridging devices. Uh, you know very well that the good outcome depends on these devices and based on the current evidence, we don't have a dedicated approved device for this uh, indication at least. Uh, this is my favorite uh, point in the debate. But uh, I want to hear you now, uh, which is your experience? So we have different types of balloon expandable covered stands. Very shortly, we have the Advanta with the stainless steel uh, endoskeleton, we have the VBX uh, with uh, stainless steel without connection of the struts, we have the Bentley B-Graft, uh, we have the B-Graft Plus. Can you give us a short comment on your strategy and philosophy about the bridging devices? And I think it's nice that it is a non-industry founded webinar so we can speak open. Yes, uh, we, we, we use both a bridging stand, the Advanta and the Bentley stand. The Bentley yeah. stand has a cobalt chrome uh, stand. And uh, now we are participating also in a, a, in a, a prospective registry for, uh, for, the, for the Bentley uh, role in these in this, uh, cases, in the FIVAR cases, and also the Bentley Plus stand for the BIVAR cases. So perhaps in, in a couple of years, we will know more about the, the performance of these stands uh, in more cases, in a, in a prospective manner. But uh, in my experience, both, both stands, the Advanta stand and the Bentley stand perform well in these cases. Excellent. Uh, one question. So we saw in the drawing, we, you have an infrarenal conical neck, as uh, Jean-Paul highlighted. You decided to go and extend your seal zone involving the visceral and renal arteries, which was the reason which gave you the, let's say, the feeling that I, you didn't trust the infrarenal solution, and you decide to go suprarenally extending the seal zone. Yes, thank you. This is an excellent case. And this is actually a, 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 an excellent question. And this is a typical case because we see this a lot that we have a conical neck and throm thrombogenic neck. And in, in our experience, at least, we most of the times uh, um, choose the fever solution for these cases. And in, like in this case, we, we didn't have an option for a two-fold fenestrated device for the renals because most of the times the mesenteric artery and the celiac trunk are also involved in the pathology. So most of the times we have a four-fold fenestrated device. And uh, mm -hmm. this is where, where our first choice in this patient is.
but I will show in a minute also some cases where we, okay. we prefer some other solutions. Okay, let's see the next case. So the next case is a 63 year old male patient with a 6.2 centimeter triple A. He has a horseshoe kidney. You can see here the CT in the axial view. You can see here the mesenteric artery, the upper renal arteries, and now the horseshoe kidney. And in the middle of the aneurysm, you have a, a big artery, a renal artery originating from the aneurysm will come here. And this, this artery is also dividing in, into two big branches, as you see. We didn't have any involvement of the iliacs here in this case. Here again, this artery, which is, which is the perfusing the isthmus of the horseshoe kidney and both parts of the kidneys with two branches. And if you would choose for an endovascular solution, in this case, we have to sacrifice one of these big branches. Again, here, the coronary view of this horseshoe kidney, which is going in front of the aneurysm, as you see here. And in this case, we chose for an open repair in mm -hmm. this young patient mm -hmm. through a, through a pararectal incision. We exposed the whole abdominal artery, aorta, uh, after a visceral re renal transposition to the right side. And we had a big exposure, a nice exposure of the whole uh, abdominal aorta. We had a suprarenal clamping in this case above the upper renal arteries. And we did a, a tubular graft interposition between the renal artery and the iliac bifurcation and the reimplantation of this big uh, isthmus artery. We had a cold perfusion in the, in the, in the time where we, before performing the proximal anastomosis for the, uh, for the kidney. This is an, the open case. And I, I, can, I can show you also another case, the third case, which is an, again an endovascular case. This was an 83 year old male patient with a symptomatic 7.5 .7, centimeter aneurysm who came with abdominal and back pain. He had a severe comorbidity with coronary artery disease and arterial hypertension. You see the, the aneurysm in this case, the renals. In this case, we didn't really have any infrarenal neck, as you can see here. Also in the coronary view, you see the aneurysm. We don't see an, any infrarenal neck in this case. Because of the, of the urgency of the case and the pain and back pain and abdominal pain in this patient, we performed a chimney EVAR with two chimneys for the renals and an endurant device, bifurcated device distally. And we, we didn't observe any endoleak in the intraoperative angiography because of, of a poor renal function. We didn't perform a, a postoperative CT, but we performed a, a contrast enhanced ultrasound and we didn't see any endoleak also postoperatively in this case. And the patient was free from pain after that. And now he's re recovering in the rehabilitation clinic and we will come back to us for the postoperative CT, but he, he had a very nice postoperative course. So in this, in this slide, I, I summarize our, our protocol for these juxta renal aneurysms in Aachen. We really, uh, FIVA, we, chose, we choose FIVA as a primary treatment option for most of the patients, which are older asymptomatic patients. We choose the open surgical repair when fever is not feasible for anatomic reasons, like in the case that I showed you with a horseshoe kidney. We also choose open surgical repair if the patients are willing to, to get an open repair in younger patients. Also in symptomatic patients and ruptured aneurysms with, with, uh, with not prohibitive operative risk. And of course, in mycotic aneurysms when we need xenogenic uh, reconstruction of the aorta. And we choose a CIVAR procedure, as I saw in the last case, in symptomatic patients that are unfit for open repair. Fantastic. Uh, fantastic.
first of all, I'm more than happy, Jean-Paul, to see in one webinar, I think it's the first time when we are seeing very nice interoperative imaging from open repair. Because uh, in all uh, webinars, I think uh, the last two years with Corona, we saw only endo, 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 etc. cetera. Uh, and also the indication is excellent. I don't believe that you can find a better treatment approach for this specific indication as an open repair. And the demonstration and analysis of your approach, Drossos, was excellent. Um, regarding the fenestrated endografting, we know we have the um, anaconda. You showed anaconda options. Uh, also, do you have experience with the cook device? Which is your preference? Uh, which would you recommend for a colleague who, who wants to start and learn fenestrated endografting? Do you see differences? Or, Jean Paul, your opinion also? What, what would you recommend? Which device should be, is, let's say, not easier, but more prone for a, a starter? Yes, if, if I may start with, with the answer, uh, um, we, we, we use really both of the devices, Anaconda and Cook. Uh, both of the devices have, have uh, pros and contras. I started with, uh, uh, with my fever experience with a Cook device. Um, and I think this is the device that most of the people are using. Um, here in Aachen, I learned the, the Anaconda device. This device has also some advantages. In angulated necks, we have some, you have a better freedom for your fenestration. In these angulated cases, you can, uh, we had a case with six fenestrations. Um, and, uh, but of course, in, in experience hands, also with a good device, you have excellent uh, results in most anatomies. So it's, uh, we really use for, for dissection cases, for, for example, we mostly use the cook device because also for the thoracoabdominal aneurysms, going from for type two aneurysms, we use the Cook device. But for most uh, juxtarenal aneurysms nowadays, we use the Anaconda device. So we try to split uh, the devices uh, uh, in two for for these juxtarenal cases. How is your preference, Jean Paul? Yeah, well, I don't really have a preference, although I think the armamentarium of Cook also for the torque abdominal ones and the branches, etc., is is larger. So, yeah, I think we all also um, educate and train uh, fellows, uh, residents, etc. So that's why we have one workhorse, uh, and that is uh, that is the Cook uh, device. I think. Well, for maybe uh, angulated necks, uh, anaconda uh, can be preferred. There's only one thing about during follow-up. I think the 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 the, the short-term outcomes are similar, but we experience uh, some, um, how do you say, it, some changes in the morphology of the uh, of the fenestrated anaconda uh, during long-term follow-up with a few patients. That is that the that the saddle shape of the of the proximal rings they they become horizontal. It's like kind of dilatation, and so it's not really migration. But the only thing is that the that the balloon expanded covered stents uh, are well, they are um, maybe a little bit under pressure. Uh, so we had a few cases where we had to intervene. Uh, maybe it's because of the anatomy, I don't know, uh, but that is uh, in a few of those cases during longer term follow up with the fenestrated anaconda. Yeah. Uh, we have to figure that out. Regarding the Chivar case, congratulations, very nice results. I'm pretty sure that Professor Jacobs gave you congratulations after the case. Uh, you showed us also that uh, this was a case without neck, uh, actually, infrarinally. So outside of IFU also for Chivar, um, because we, we learned that at least two millimeter necks is better to have it in order to fix better the, the device and minimize the gutters issue. What I was thinking is if you are performing uh, this case with a very nice result in the urgent setting in this hostile uh, neck anatomy, why not to, to do it more routinely? So why is your preference to go uh, for fever only and not to evaluate more the Chivar option, especially in more standard and more friendly anatomical conditions. Is there lack of evidence? Um, which, is, which factor influence you to say, I would prefer to go for fourfold fenestrations better? 
τρόσος. Yes, I think this is uh, in my experience. We don't have a large experience with these CVAR cases. We we only perform a couple a year, mm-hmm. and really in, in only urgent and emergent cases. So that's why, and we are we are of course um, to try to see any uh, long term results with this um, with these devices, and um, that's why we perform the fenestrated um, mm-hmm. solution as a as a primary as a primary uh, therapeutic uh, option. Mm. What I think is a limitation for Chivar, I think Jean-Paul, is that you have to use per se the access from above. And this means, of course, technically a more, let's say, yeah, technically is not so easy always, especially if if the renal artery is stenosed, you have to have someone also to be uh, in the upper place of of the patient to hold the sheets. You know very well if you're going to lose the sheath after deployment, you're going to lose the renal. So the, I think in my eyes, the main limitation for the abroad applicability is that uh, the absence, at least for the moment, of a transfemoral uh, approach and option. Yeah, I agree. I think Chiva is really a forehand procedure. And uh, the physician who is doing the, the upper access, I think, is maybe even more uh, important than uh, the one who is taking care of the, of the, of the endograph. And of course, there are some uh, complications by the uh, upper extremity access, um, uh, which is at around, I think, 4 to 5%. Uh, and, and what Drossos also, I think, perfectly shows is that even in a challenging uh, CDR trunk, you can really have successful access from uh, from the femoral artery. Yeah. Yes. Do you use also steerable sheaths? It is a good option from the transfemoral axis. We have the possibilities to use trans, uh, steerable sheaths. I think this improves the armamentarium and the cannulation of uh, challenging uh, visceral vessels. I'm receiving uh, the remark <laughs> that we have to hear the and see probably the poll question, dear Drossos. Um, um, we, 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 we would like to give you now, therefore we had the discussion, a little bit time to consider. Let's see now and please vote uh, the poll question. That was the question again. And now following the presentation, how would you now treat the patient suffering from AAA that doesn't qualify for EVA? And we have these four solutions or options, FIVAR, Open Surgical Repair, ESAR and CVAR. And the results. So waiting a little bit for the results uh, in order to give probably open repair would be 100%. <laughs> we are waiting. You can still vote. I have one question for both of you from, uh, again, from Greece. Uh, if you have in the, um, in the neck uh, an accessory renal artery, uh, we know and there, are, there is a little bit of literature that you can, of course, sacrifice and you don't have to consider this. But I remember one case when the patient came two or three years later with uh, uh, persistent arterial hypertension. So I would say, can you give us some, uh, let's say, tip? Uh, which kind of accessory renal artery would you sacrifice? Which kind of uh, accessory renal artery would you say we have? to ensure the patency and go, for example, for open approach or fenestrated endografting? Oh, this is a difficult one. I, I think it's, it's, maybe it's not evidence-based, but um, I assume that both uh, kidneys are, are okay and there's not uh, any renal failure. So it's only one accessory renal artery at one uh, uh, kidney. Yeah, if it's, if it's uh, really, of course it's, well, we don't perform a uh, renography uh, standard, uh, but if it's uh, if it perfuses uh, less than twenty percent of that kidney, and the the accessory artery is less than three millimeters, uh, we uh, yeah we sacrifice it. Okay. Or of course, in, in in case of open surgery, if if there's any need for open surgery, I think we always try to reimplant uh, the accessory artery. Yeah. Yeah. And the final question, I think it's very important. Can you give us some, let's say, tips? With, when would you, would you say for a colleague to start treating challenging necks? When, which, is, which are the most important criteria to decide to go from the infrarenal approach to the pararenal, suprarenal uh, treatment options? 
what do you think is important? Is uh, the experience only? Is the team? Uh, is also the equipment? I think it is also crucial. Which is your? Let's let's give us a tip. For me, as physician, um, I have experience with Ivar. What should I do if I have a juxta pararenal pathology? Yeah, it's well. I think it, it's it's really a combination. It's really about the team. It's about the equipment. It's about the OR. Uh, is it a hybrid room or is it a C arm? I would not start with a C arm. I would really do it in in the, in, in in a hybrid OR. Uh, you need a team who is um, uh, experienced, uh, especially also for the chin, what we said, with a forehand uh, procedure. Um, and yeah, what I uh, would also advocate is to not, even if it's, if, if you have experience of 30 standard EVARs and you treat the first time a really hostile neck with chimney or with fenestra, of course, always have somebody in the room who really is experienced. Uh, and knows all the pitfalls uh, and don't be afraid to ask uh, a proctor or whatever uh, but I think don't start even in that first cases uh, on your own. Drossos? Yeah, I, I fully agree with, with Jean-Paul and uh, regarding the accessory renals uh, costas, I would, I would not change my strategy only uh, uh, because of uh, an accessory artery as, as Jean-Paul also said if you have a good patency of, of the main arteries on both sides, then of, uh, you, can, you can, of course, make a fenestration for an for a accessory artery that is as big as four millimeters. For mm -hmm. that case, you can use a five millimeter fenestration, but below that, then you don't have a, a good patency of these vessels. So in this case, I would also sacrifice these vessels. And, and this is uh, a very good tip. So less than four millimeter in diameter, due to the fact that we don't have a bridging device, or at least the patency is not going to be probably superior, uh, I would sacrifice also. Um, this is a very good tip, I think, for our colleague in Greece. So, dear colleagues, it is, uh, I don't have to say how nice it was to hear your opinions about this uh, clinical reality, the challenging neck. It was great that we had the opportunity to present uh, without any bias all the available options, case-based discussion. I'm pretty sure that uh, the possibility of having on demand in the Radcliffe Vascular homepage, uh, the very nice webinar from today will be highlighted and also will be also watched by many colleagues. I am receiving all the time questions, but <laughs> I have to say that today at six, we have to stop. It was a great pleasure to see you again. Thank you very much for the participation and for your great input in this webinar. You're welcome. It was a pleasure. Thank, Thank you very much.